Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthy Hong Kong. Welcome to the third and final video in a series of discussions with Professor Luigi Fontana from the University of Sydney. In the first two videos in this Path to Longevity series, we talked about diet and nutrition and exercise. The topic of this last video is mental health as we age. He talks about the importance of maintaining a healthy mind by always challenging your brain to avoid cognitive decline and the importance of a meaningful life by helping other people. I think Professor Fontana has a very beautiful message to deliver here. We are not here just to live longer, but to also live a healthy, fulfilling and harmonious life. If you do like the video, please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for notifications when new videos are released. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. And with that, let me start the interview. Um, so now what I'd like to kind of move on to is kind of maintaining a healthy and active mind because, right. uh, I mean, as you mentioned in the book, you know, uh, it's all very well being healthy and old. If your mind is going, then it, it, your quality of life is definitely going to deteriorate. Um, right. And so you, you talk about a number of things that we can do to uh, kind of maintain a, a healthy mind as we get older. So could you yeah. kind of talk about some of those? Look, you know, one of the pillars of traditional Chinese medicine, other, other ancient you know, medical schools that, of course, you know, they are not scientific, but still they were not stupid. They were making observation. They were like an anecdotal observation, you know, for many, many centuries was brain training, mind training. So they believed, you know, that mind was like the muscle. So if you want to preserve muscle mass, you have to do, so you have to do exercise. Otherwise, you know, you basically, you are, you are, if you're not using, you know, if you, if you have a, if you have a, a, a fracture and you, if you are forced, to stay in your in your bed, you know, for months, you, you, we know you are losing muscle mass. If you go on the on the sp on, on, on the shuttle space in, in the space, you know, with a shuttle, you are going to lose muscle mass and bone mass because it's gravity. Okay. Mm. The same is for the brain. You know, if you don't use it, you know, you are not uh, stimulating the growth of synapses. Okay. Uh, synapses are this protrusion from the neurons that are important for learning things. Mm. So if now, you know, I learn to play violin, I'm slowly building up the synapses so that, you know, then without thinking, I'm able to play, you know, a, a sonata because I built this network connection, these synaptic protrusions in my brain that helped me to masterize that task. So the rule is that, you know, as we get older, we, we have to keep challenging our brain. So a lot of people say, you know, I'm old, so no, there is no point me to do, to learn because I'm already old. No, if you learn new things, if you learn, you know, for example, to, just to give an exa stupid example, I live most of my life in US and in Italy and we drive on the right, mm -hmm. okay? When I came here, the first few months, couple of months, to drive on the left was challenging because my brain was used, you know, to look at the street, you know, and, you know, in a different way. And so it took like a couple of months to build new synapses so that now I jump on the car without thinking I can drive on the left as I drive on the right. Why? Because I build these synapses. And the same happens for new languages, you know, playing a new instrument, you know, uh, learning how to write or paint or anything. You know, the more we stimulate, you know, our brain, the more active and less cognitive decline there is. You know, there are now studies showing, you know, you know to prevent cognitive decline, you know, apart from diet and exercise, you know, cognitive training, meaning, you know, learning new things is very important, okay? And again, there is a physiological mechanism that is the build-up of synapses. Plus, there are new studies showing, you know, number of neurons in the hippocampus, 
that is the, the central part of the brain for memory, they are created in adulthood. At least in mice, you know, some of the neurons in the hippocampus, they are created during, during, during the, the, the adulthood. Mm. So it's not only the synapses, but the number of neurons. In fact, you know, there are experiments where exercising people, they have less shrinking, less atrophy of the hippocampus as they, go, as they get older if they exercise, okay? So again, you know, there is, there is two-way communication between cognitive training and our health and exercise. They are reinforcing each other in promoting brain health and in, in uh, slowing down cognitive decline, decline. That is one of the major issues in our society. There is a prediction of an increase in 300% in dementia in the next few decades, you know, and uh, so it's really worrying, you know, because dementia is a, is, a, is a terrible disease, not only for the people who has it, but especially for the family and the society. So the other important aspect that I was talking in the book is sleep, the mm. balance between rest, activity and, and, and rest. Because there are more and more data showing that, you know, when we are sleeping, our brain goes through different phases that, you know, we can measure with the EAG. So we can measure the electrical activity of our brain as we, as we go deep in, in our sleep. And what we are finding is that, you know, people who are able to sleep in the deep phase, in the, in, in the, in the phase three sleep, they are during this phase, you know, basically you are uh, lowering, you are lowering inflama brain inflammation, you are getting rid of garbage, you are consolidating memory. There are studies, you know, showing, you know, if you, if you sleep deeply, you are consolidating the information that you have acquired during the day by certain plasticity processes in, in your brain. So basically it's like, you know, you are moving the information from the RAM memory to the hard disk during the night. So sleeping deeply is very important for, for kids and for adults to consolidate memory. It's important to, you know, remove garbage in your brain that is accurate during the day, inflammation. And there are now beautiful data in, in, in animals and in humans published in science showing that, you know, people who are, uh, uh, sleeping poorly, especially sleep fragmentation, is conducive of dementia. So it has been measured, you know, during the night, if you don't sleep well, if you don't sleep in deep phase, your brain, your neurons are producing beta amyloid and tau. Again, publishing mm -hmm. science. In humans, not only mice, in humans. So basically, good sleep, is one of the other important pieces of the puzzle for preventing cognitive decline. Right. I think that's really good. Uh, so one, already one very little question. Um, so do you see? So so there's there's games that you can use. So so obviously you know um, doing one thing, one way of le is learning new things, and that challenges your brain. But there's also games like I don't know if you're aware of Dual and Back. Uh, a game where you yeah yeah there are studies showing you know you know this type of sudoku all this type of yeah. is one of the instruments you know we can use you know to improve uh, uh, memory and to reduce cognitive decline yes yeah that's something okay. you know that you know, can be used in association with uh, different type of exercises are mm -hmm. stimulating different part of the brain okay so you know yeah. if you do different type of, uh, depending on what part of the brain you are using, you are working on different part of, you know, the, the visual is on the back, you know, so different areas of the brain that are controlling different activities. And that's why, for example, when you play piano, you have different parts that are activated because you have to activate, you know, the sound, you have to activate the fine movements, you have to activate, you know, the, 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 the watching. So, you know, you activate multiple, multiple area of the brains where you are stimulating and you are coordinating the activity so you know you can you can uh, have you can play piano successfully yeah right so that's important and i think you know 
we don't have time, but I think, you know, it's important to mention that another important point that, you know, people that are underestimating, especially people who are obsessed, you know, with, uh, with aging by itself is the mental, the, 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 our superior. I think, you know, you know, you know, as human beings, you know, we are here not just to live longer for the sake of live longer, but to live a healthy, fulfilling, harmonious life. At least, at least that's my point of view, you know. I mean, my, my goal in life is to live a ha happy, to learn a lot. You know, for me, life is like a beautiful journey mm -hmm. where you, you are born, you know, in this planet and you are born in this society with all these cultural dogmas, all these, you know, social cultural issues that you know they are they are in some way it's like you know if you have different type of glasses you know so based on the glasses you are born with you see the world in a completely different way and that's that's a problem because these these cultural social religious type of uh, perception of the world that are illusions they can make your life terrible or good, you know, because, you know, if you are not really able to live your life and to make the best of yourself and enjoy this trip and learning from yourself, learning, you know, why you make mistakes, why you walk and you, you, you get experience, you know, you can become a better human being, you're more compassionate, more happy, more um, uh, free, but inner free, not free in terms of being free of doing whatever you want. And people, they are underestimating the importance of that. They are uh, underestimating that, you know, you know, to use, you know, some of these in instruments like mindfulness, meditation, there are some breathing techniques, you know, as I, as I say in my book, you know, by slowing your, uh, your, your respiratory rate from the typical 12, 16 breaths per minute, if you voluntarily by doing deep diaphragmatic respiration, you lower your heart, your, your respiratory rate, you are reducing blood pressure, you are increasing heart rate variability, and you are reducing inflammation. There are beautiful paper in nature showing that, you know, when you activate the parasympathetic nervous system by, by, by deep respiration, you know, the, the neurotransmitter of the, paras, of the parasympathetic nervous system of the vagal nerv nerve, is acetylcholine. And acetylcholine binds to specific macrophage receptor and they are inhibiting the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Showing that, you know, with our brain, with our mind training, you know, we can control some ancestral, you know, new, uh, autonomous, nervous system pathways that control heart rate, blood pressure, inflammation, and many other uh, physiological functions. Uh, and again, you know, one of the problem is that in our societies that are overly uh, individualistic and, uh, and, uh, and obsessive, you know, we are, you know, we are, we are, we are living in a society, you know, where more and more people, they have mental issues, they have psychological, emotional issues, the rate of depression and suicide is on the rise. I mean, I, I was appalled here in Australia to hear, you know, you know, a lot of teenagers, they suffer of depression and, uh, and they have, you know, ideas of suicide. And in fact, you know, there is a ministry of mental health. Never heard in Europe. In, U in Australia, there is a federal minister of mental health and there is a, a local ministry. You know, the New South Wales, you know, the Victoria State, they have a minister of mental health. There is, not, there is the minister of health and there, there is the minister of mental health, you know, because the number of people with mental issues is so high and so prevalent that it's becoming a major social issue. Mm -hmm. And people, they don't realize that, you know, a lot of the problems so why people despite you know they have an idea of how nutrition exercise and all this stuff they are still doing unhealthy stuff is probably because there is this under training of the mind and again you know you can train mind by learning new things as we said 
but you can train the mind also with meditation, deep respiration, other stuff. Because you know, we know that you know that you know, for example, if you have an excess, if you are too much stressed, you know, you need to relieve that stress. And so people normally they 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 use drugs or alcohol or, or food or you know gambling or sex or shopping as a way to release, you know, to relieve some of the stress transiently, even if they know that, you know, that's on the long term is bad, they need to do something to de- relieve their negative emotional uh, feelings. So to stay a bit better transiently. And that's because, you know, when we do this, this addictive type of, uh, of, of, of behaviors, you know, we release dopamine you have, we have a burst of dopamine that, you know, transiently is making us a bit better, but then, you know, we go back, you know, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, and become obsessive. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's why, you know, you have this epidemic of unhealthy consumption of junk food and, and uh, opioids and alcohol and smoking and sex and the internet, you know, you know, these people now, these youngs that are obsessed, you know, on, they stay hours and hours on socials, Facebook and, all this stuff that is becoming obsessive. And there are studies showing that that's linked, you know, with unhappiness, depression, and many other uh, mental issues. And so I think, you know, a lot of people in the aging field, they are underestimating, they are concentrating too much on boosting NID or, or resveratrol, all this stuff. And they don't realize that, you know, a healthy life, again, is, is like a symphony. And, the, and our mental, our mind is very important to have a high quality life. And it's not money. It's not having 10 cars or having the new mobile or the new gadget that is going to make you happy and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and free and able to enjoy this beautiful journey that is our life and, and make the best of yourself you know, to, to really having a meaning, meaningful life that is going to hopefully not only help yourself, but also helping other people. So compassion, kind heart, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and love, you know, and altruism. Unfortunately, they are not part of our medical education, or our school education. And it's a major problem that make the life of, very, of too many people a, a very unhappy and, uh, and not optimal life. Yes, I, I think it's great that you have that in your book as well. That, that's one of the, the sections that you, you talk about to create this holistic view of having both a meaningful and a long life, not just a long life. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that, yeah and so I, I think we, we kind of talked about meditation and breathing there. So I, I think if, if we could kind of go to the, just quickly wrap up. So I had a few... Yeah. Kind of over a few things so i mean one of the things i think you mentioned in your book uh that there are centenarians in these blue zones who get to like 100 with with like no chronic diseases right i mean it, like 20 percent of them or something like that i mean so so do you think that's like possible i mean if we follow the, the kind of recommendations we we see that ordinary people could could get to that kind of age no, it's not in the in, it's not in the blue zones. That's the oh. that's the, oh. everywhere. Twenty oh, percent right. of the centenarians, they don't develop any chronic disease before one hundred years of age. So that's you know, is a general uh, finding. I think you know in the blue zone, I don't think there are data, but probably it's much higher than twenty percent in those zones. And um, yeah, so. I believe that based on what we have discovered, you know, as we discussed at the beginning, all these metabolic molecular pathways, we can really maximize both health span and lifespan quite considerably. If you think, you know, you know, basically only 150 years ago, uh, average life expectancy was uh, 45 years, and now is, is 80 for men and 84 for women. And that, you know, I think, you know, in Japan, uh, the number of octogenarians are, I don't remember if it's 
fifty percent. You know, so it's you know it's uh, it's amazing. You know what happened in the last one hundred years. I think that you know we have the knowledge right now to really maximize our health and drastically improve health span. And based on what we know, when you increase health span, you are increasing lifespan. Just to give you a few data, you know, there is the Framingham Heart Study, where basically is Framingham is this village in US where you know all the all the population of this village has been in this study where they have followed them up, you know, for many years, and they measured, you know, uh, cardiometabolic risk factors when they were 50 years old. Mm -hmm. And they found that, you know, people that when they were 50, they had a cholesterol less than 180 milligram deciliter, non-treated. They had a blood pressure less than 120 over 80, non-treated without drugs. Uh, they had no smoking, no diabetes, and BMI less than 25. Those people, they had a risk of myocardial infarction in the remaining part of their life of 5%. People with two or more abnormal of these mm. five cardiometabolic factors, they had a risk of 70%. So you go from 5% to 70%. But most interestingly, the average survival, it was 11 years shorter. So people with optimal cardiometabolic risk factor, they lived 40 years on average. The people on the to abnormal cardiometabolic factor 28 years. So basically 78 versus 90, okay? Right, yeah. And in this framing a heart study, only 4% of the population had the optimal cardiometabolic risk factor. Based on the study we did on, on calorie restriction and exercise, that cardiometabolic profile of this optimal can be achieved by healthy lifestyle. So we already know based on all this data, you know, you can extend probably by 10, 15 years your life span just by addressing these three or four, that is blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, and diabetes, and smoking, and, and your BMI without being extreme. Then, you know, if you do all the other stuff that we know, you know, the IGF-1 and, you know, all this stuff, I think, you know, probably, you know, you can increase much more. So let me put it like that, you know, then I think, you know, we can conclude, you know, of course, you know, genetic plays a role, you know. Uh, I think, you know, based on data we have, you know, genetic plays at 30%. 25% of our probability of living a short of love, longer life depends on our genes. These are studies done on, on um, identical twins. But let's say, you know, you are... In a, you have bad, bad genes, you know, you are born in a family where your parents are dying when, you, when they are 65, both of your parents. If you are doing everything wrong, probably you're going to die when you are 55. If you are doing everything well, probably you're going to die when you are 80. If your parents, they were both, they died when they were 80, 85. If you do everything wrong, probably you are dying when you are 65. If you're doing everything right, probably you can reach 110, 120. Right. Yeah, time is. So could you tell people um, where they can find you? So your latest research, I mean, if people want to see what you're, what you're working on now, is there some way you can find? And also where, you can, where they can find your book? Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, uh, again, you know, my research typically is published on, 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 scientific journals, you know, so basically, you know, if you go on PubMed and you put uh, Luigi Fontana, you're going to find, you know, my, my publications. Mm -hmm. I typically post every week, you know, uh, normally in the morning, you know, especially uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. If when I'm reading the literature, you know, I go through nature, science, the major journals, you know, New England, JAMA, Circulation. If I see some interesting papers that in some way they are related to health and longevity, I, I typically post them. Mm -hmm. And so I have a Facebook, a LinkedIn, and a Twitter, you know, an Instagram. And, and so I post, you know, so people, they can see, you know, if they want to follow, you know, again, you know, 
every week, you know, I post three or four new studies that I think are very, very shortly. You know, I, I, I do like a summary and the link to the paper. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's a way, you know, for people to, to, to be up, updated, you know, based on what I think is interesting in the literature, you know, searching through the major journals every week because I do that for myself. And so I, th I said, you know, look, you know, because I do by myself, why I shouldn't also maybe, you know, communicate to other people who are interested in through the socials, you know, these interesting new studies. Then, you know, sometimes when I have time, you know, I do some videos that I have my YouTube channel. And so there are a number of videos, you know, mm -hmm. you know, where I, 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 I talk about, you know, maybe I do some presentation, you know, that I do maybe from some Congress or some students, you know, so maybe I do some presentations on the, the, my view of, you know, how cardiovascular cancer and aging. And, uh, and my book is uh, available on Amazon. So basically it's yeah. called The Path to Longevity, published by Hardy Grant. And, uh, you know, you can go on Amazon and you can find it. And uh, again, you know, this is, uh, I decided to write this book, you know, because again, I thought for, for several reasons. One is that, you know, as a professor, as a doctor and professor, my salary has always been paid by taxpayers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as you know, we are, we are paid by, by uh, tax. And I thought that it was kind of obligation for me after 30 years to write, to make a summary of what I've learned in all these years as a doctor and as a scientist in this field. Because typically, you know, scientists, what they do, they publish papers and they go to, 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 to meetings, to Congress. And, you know, we communicate our data among us, you know, so, you know, it's like, you know, I, I present my data to other scientists and other doctors and, you know, the taxpayer, they don't, they don't have really access except through newspapers, but newspaper typically they take just one small piece and they make a sensational title, you know, discover the, the way to treat cancer. But, you know, it's, it's, it's typically, that's how, you know, the journalists are working. They are trying, you know, to make a nice story that is picking the attention of people. But it's not comprehensive. And, and, and most often it's, it's, it's even wrong, you know, because they are distorting the reality. So I said, you know, I think it's good for me, you know, that, you know, I try to put down in a book my understanding, Luigi Fontana. Do I know everything? No, I do not know everything but because i've been working in this field for 30 years i'm a doctor so i'm looking from the human perspective not from the mice or east worm perspective but from the human perspective and i've been translating all the research that has been done in animal models into humans i think that probably i have a better grasp than many other people who are just reading some books or some papers because I work in the field. I know all the people, I, I personally know all the people that are working in this field and I did research myself. Right. And, and the other reason is that, you know, uh, again, you know, there are too many fed and uh, distorted information out there. There are books that, you know, they are really looking in only one part of the picture. It's like, you know, going back to the analogy of the symphony, they are just concentrating on the violin. Say, so how beautiful is the violin? The sound of the violin is fantastic. You know, it has this pitch and this and that. You know, the violin is the most important, you know, the most important. And then there is another guy, no, 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 no. Look, you know, I think, you know, the flute is the most important, you know. So they describe how the flute plays and stuff like that. So each one has his own distorted, you know, view. They like one, and most most often is a is like a religion type of approach. Mm. I'm vegan, so anything that is going goes goes against, you know, my philosophy that you know, animal food is bad. I don't, I'm not going to listen to it because you know I'm vegan or I'm paleo. I'm this. I'm that. You know, and so I thought, you know, you know that you know, try to 
have a more holistic but scientific based approach you know to this topic that is so relevant for human health and environmental health you know because you know we forgot to say you know in my book the last chapter is about what we do how important it is to influence environmental health a lot of people they don't understand you know that what they eat what they do is deeply influencing global warming pollution pesticide use you know topsoil destruction and many other factors they don't realize that and you know we are starting to see the consequences this covid is mm-hmm. one In the next few years we're going to have multiple other uh, you know zoonotic diseases coming out of these intensive animal farmings and you know we saw what happened you know economically is a disaster so we lost trillions of dollars because of this one and by the way people that are hypertensive diabetic obese they have a much higher of uh, uh, ending up in icu and dying of covid you know what we know that you know healthy people they have a very low risk even if they get the covid the, the risk of uh, ending up in a, in a emergency in, in a icu and dying is much lower than people who are metabolically abnormal that's another good reason why you know you can take control of your health even for disease like the the this infective disease and then you know the the global warming people they don't realize what is coming you know the global warming yeah. is going to be major you know these yeah. uh, you know the the change in temperature the extreme weather conditions you know the rising of the sea levels all this stuff economically and financially is going to be a disaster and people they just leave you know with this fat you know i'm a paleo i'm a vegan i'm here i'm there and don't they realize you know what's happening around them right yeah i so i i really enjoyed the book it's very easy read uh, very practical and also com- comprehensive um i i like the appendix the uh like these are the things you need to measure they're very very practical very good so i i definitely recommend that book um so yes, thank you very much. You've been very generous with your time this morning, uh, Professor Fontana. That, that was very he- helpful, very excellent. And um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Okay, thank Bye. you. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative and actionable. I would like to thank Professor Fontana for being so generous with his time and insights for this series of videos. We will be back with further videos in the area of health and longevity soon, so please stay tuned. I wish you all well and I will speak to you again soon.